All right. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dr. Coach Show. I am your host, Dr. Coach Danny Pueblos, and today I have my great friend, Dr. Jared Lamkin. How are you doing today, Jared? Doing well, Doc. Um, just enjoying, enjoying the summer and just enjoying everyone. Uh, just coming back to, well, we'll get into that a little bit, but just enjoying having the students come back, you know, um, so I'm enjoying that whole thing, enjoying the weather. So, hey, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, hey, guys, you know, it's been a minute since we, since we last filmed, but, you know, I want to bring, I wanted to bring uh, Jared here on because, you know, him and I have really good conversations. Uh, just a little bit about Jared. He, uh, he has his doctorate in uh, sports psychology from Capella University. Um, and also he's been working in the field of mental health. Um, and also substance abuse counseling for over 15 years. So definitely has a lot of experience. And this is why I always enjoy having conversations with them. Um, he's working towards, you know, getting his, uh, his certified, to, to be a certified mental performance consultant, you know, through ASP. Um, so yeah, he, he's, he's, he's there. He's there. He has a lot of great experience. Um, he's currently serving as a counselor and sports psychology liaison uh, two student athletes at Winston Salem State University. So that's currently in North Carolina, correct? Correct. You got it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and you're from Philly, if I'm not mistaken, right? I know we've talked about Philly a lot. Yep. Born, born and raised in Philly. Born and raised in Philly. Born and raised in Philly. Rocky Balboa, my guy. <laughs> and, and all the Johns. <laughs> all the Johns. <laughs> Yeah, I tell you, man. Yeah. One, of the, one of these days, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk up. I'm gonna run up the, those stairs in the in Philly where where, <laughs> where Rocky did. I'm gonna go. And after that, I'm gonna go get me a nice Philly Philly cheesesteak, and I'm gonna eat those Jones and just go. <laughs> I don't know if I use that that, that phrase correctly. <laughs> you can't. But, no, no matter no matter how you use the word, it's always going to be right. <laughs> uh, sweet, sweet. So yeah, you know, hey, it's uh, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. Um, you know, we always have good conversation, and that's why I wanted to bring our conversations to life and so that, um, you know, other people can enjoy them, right? Because you and I ha have been in the field for many years, um, yeah. and I feel that so many, so, so many of the topics we talk about, and, I, and I've told you before, man, like, oh, man, like, this is, you know, can we, can we just talk? You know, we could just talk and talk about it, uh, but I know these are certain topics that what we're going to talk about today that a lot of people don't really address too much, right? Yeah. Um, and so, I, you know, one thing that I wanted to cover today that's been a, a somewhat of a hot topic recently was, um, or is the, this, the, the challenges of, of athletes who, who are transitioning for, from one level to the next, right? So for instance, going from like youth to high school, high school to college, college to pro, amateur to pro, amateur to Olympian, right? So, um, you know, having, you know, personally, I, I worked with so many different athletes from all over the world, um, in all, all different sports, you know, from the big, you know, uh, big three or big four sports in, in the U.S. Um, to the, the not so common ones, you know. Um, and that's why I've gained an appreciation for all these other sports that I never grew up on uh, and just learning from my clients. Um, but also being able to understand um, all the different types of challenges that, that they've gone through and being able to work with them as they're going through that transition from one level to the next. Because, um, you know, even if you're a casual sports fan, you see, um, you know, you see the, the, the drafts, right? The NFL draft, the NBA draft, or, you know, you see these, uh, just the, the signings of, you know, these uh, younger kids or, you know, the commitments from high school, college. So, um, but that's all we really see, right? We don't really, we don't, most people don't really, see what goes on behind the scenes, you know? Um, so like, what, what, what is, what is your experience been just like working? I know you work with a lot of the athletes at, at the collegiate level, uh, but I know you have worked with a lot of people um, in general. So what was your general experience been just seeing that transition? Yeah. Well, I can tell that just watching the collegiate student make their transitions from high school into college athletics you know, um, it's it's almost simultaneously this situation where they're making not just the athletic jump, but they're making social jump as well. And 
they all kind of coincide with one another. And I know that I noticed recently in a lot of the uh, both female and male student athletes, the social uh, the social aspect of it is the issue for them. Um, they feel as though they can compete. They're pretty confident about being able to compete athletically. Uh, their fear and their apprehension usually comes in with, will I be accepted by these new players or new athletes that I'm going to be around? Uh, how, how much should I put myself out there in terms of uh, my strengths as an athlete? Should I diminish myself, make myself small, or should I go in and be this grandiose character? Uh, should I just, you know, um, just listen, take notes, or should I come in with knowledge? So there's various aspects to it, especially when I talk to a lot of the athletes, they just don't know how to approach it. And I think that that's the main thing that I, I've been seeing a lot. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, you know, we can go on day as far as the, the similarities between um, athletes and non-athletes, right? Um, you look at just the general population who, um, you know, they, they go from working in one industry for so long um, that it's, um, hold on one second. So, you know, it, it's, it, like you mentioned, the social aspect of it is, is big. Um, I, I've, I've seen many, just every, every level, see how, as you mentioned, um, this, going from one level to the next, seeing and hearing and talking to these athletes about um, just kind of their fears, their fears about, I don't know if I'm going to fit in. I don't know if this is going to be what's best for me, um, especially when you have athletes who are kind of like on the fence about continuing to play at the next level, whatever that, whatever that next level is, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a big issue that I've found is um, when they have pressure, that comes along with that, right? Um, and, and seeing and, and talking to these athletes about, um, you know, going from youth to high school or high school to college, which you see a lot of, um, mm -hmm. you know, there's that pressure of them continuing to play. And what most people don't realize is <laughs> everything building from that, the foundation that has been created up to that point um, can definitely impact how they view their their situation, how they view um, the, their their how they view this their position on like in that sport, how they view the sport, how they view playing sports, right? Because going back, if they if they were raised um, and always feeling pressure by either coaches, parents, peers, all of the above um, mm -hmm. to do well, right? Especially if, if that kid is talented. Once they get to the high school, college level, um, you know, it, it's that pressure as sometimes, and I've seen this many times, where they, 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 they sort of mentally and emotionally burn out. Um, and that's something that I've always tried, and that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> but, and that's something yeah. I try to, like, just caution parents with is, um, you know, you, uh, your son or daughter can, can be the most talented athlete going into the next level. They might get recruited. They might get the scholarship opportunities, all that good stuff. But uh, what you what you don't want to do is to create a negative association with the sport um, or just playing sports in general to to where the point is like when they get to that next level. Um, and even like going from youth to high school, once they get to that point, sometimes they'll quit. Right. Or mm -hmm. if they continue to play the sport, they'll uh, you know, they'll just they'll, it's like a job. Right. And so there's that. Yeah. Also, there's that whole dynamic. That's a whole, like I said, it's a whole other issue with burnout. Um, yeah. When you look at college. Right. Because go from high school, to college, that, that's a huge leap in itself. Right. Uh, I mm -hmm. mean, just, you know, take out sports for a second. Uh, just being a, a college uh, student is a challenge in, in itself. And so when, when yeah. you couple that with um, with the challenge of being a student athlete, of having to attend practice every single day with having to, you know, do the homework, do, you know, get ready for the exams, all that stuff, right? And that's why 
listen, you know, I've worked with athletes at all levels. Um, I definitely appreciate the hard work that the pros do. But, man, I mean, I, I, I was a student athlete, okay, um, you know, just for many years growing up, you know, going to from elementary school, middle school, high school, and and having to, like, do homework and stay up late and then wake up for zero period of weightlifting. You know, where I'm waking up at 5 a.m., 6 a.m. And so, you know, you these, these athletes, these student athletes up until the college level, they're having to deal with that, you know, and, and it's tough. So it's yeah. like, you know, I know like with the with the basketball team that I, that I helped coach at the Orange Coast College, the, the women's basketball team, um, I, you know, talking to them, I know it's tough. And, and yeah. I, I know like this, I get it. I get it. I know it's tough to be a student athlete. You're not the first person to tell me that. And you won't be my last. Um but it comes with the territory, right? Yep. And so whether they're up to that challenge or not, that's what kind of makes or breaks some people when, when they get to the next level. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, and the key, the key word is challenge, you know, because as you move along in each phase, the challenges become greater. They're, I would say that the uh, stakes are higher. Uh, when you're in little league, let's just, Take a little league uh, uh, sport, for instance. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but now that's even becoming more serious now, you know, because you have a lot of parents who are looking at their little leaguers five, ten years down the road. They're saying, okay, this is what you are now, and that pressure to develop early is upon little league, little leaguers a lot more than it was years ago. Um, and I have to definitely say that um, it has to be attributed to the dollars that are potentially out there for little leaguers, maybe to transition into professionals, you know? Um, and if a parent sees that they have this little league athlete who has the potential of really being something special in the next five or 10 years, well, they're going to try to get that kid to, uh, just be this person that they may not necessarily want to become internally. Um, one, one of my biggest analogies has always been just watching the development of Michael Jackson, the entertainer for so long. Uh, here's someone that never got an opportunity to fully be a child mm -hmm. because his talent from such a young age is viewed as, okay, we've got to capitalize on this talent. You know, you have this, you have everything that the world wants to see. Uh, he could never even do shows without his brothers. Um, well, I'm sorry, his brothers couldn't do shows without him, mm -hmm. you know, because he was the star. And that message is perpetuated over a period of time. And this young mind of six, seven, eight, nine years old is starting to embrace the um, seriousness of at that early age, before they, this person is learning how serious what they're doing is and how much it means to everyone else. That's a lot of pressure to put on a young person. And then when you look at it from an athletic standpoint, it's, it's um, a very difficult situation because what typically happens at that age is that your parents are promoting you to do well in school, but the message that you're getting also is you have to be a great athlete. So that transition um, can be what I would consider to be a very difficult one for a little league athlete if they're not given the right messages by their leadership, their, their, their parents and their coaches and things like that. So I, those are the kinds of things that I worry about that aspect of the transition from that little league age to maybe through that elementary, middle school age, you know? Yeah, um, great points. And, it, and, that, and that time period, that, that youth, that literally time going into high school, um, it, it's, it's massive for, for athletes because um, that can make or break their future <laughs> in that sport. Now, of course, they could, they could go off and do some, something else and be great at that, right? But... Um, you know, if, you know, say that this, you have a kid who just loves playing a sport, 
Um, and then they just continuously are getting bombarded by people telling them how great they are, right? Um, parents telling them, you know, oh, you're going to be, you know, a star at the next level. Um, and then, you know, these kids are still in Little League, right? Um, and, and going into high school, uh, and then you have these high schoolers trying to recruit. Um, you know, this this is why I, 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 I caution people just to be careful with that stuff, right? Um, don't take away the fun of the game because once that's it, that's taken out, it, it's it's so hard to get back. Um, mm -hmm. It's not impossible because I've, I've helped athletes do that, but it's hard, right? Because they now they, they go from playing the sport just for the fun of it and, and enjoying it, right, and loving loving the game um, to now it's a means to an end, which is to get a scholarship, which mm -hmm. is to go pro, to where it, you know that's all it is. Hey, and for some people, and, I, and I've talked to pro athletes about this, a couple of them told me, like, hey, and this I'm sure this is, not, you know, not uncommon, like, this is a job for me. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that love of the, of the game is not really there anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and which is sad for me to hear, right, because, you know, I, I love the game and just so many different sports. I just love this, uh, this is what sports represent, you know. Yep. And yep. when I hear athletes, especially at the elite levels, when they tell me that, they don't have that anymore where they just it's just a job it's a means to an end you know mm -hmm. that breaks my heart right as I, as, I, as, I, as a as a sports fan in general um yeah. because i understand how important sports are to uh just you know our general population especially the young ones and because it teaches them so many life skills right and so when you have a young child going up into the, the high school level the way their caregivers, parents, peers, coaches, the way they handle that situation um, can can definitely hurt them, as we mentioned, but also it can help them. If that, they can help breathe that confidence, right? Um, they can help breathe that that that, that self-efficacious, this kind of feeling going into that next step and say, hey, yeah, I have the talent, but I'm also driven. I want to get better, right? And this is why, you know, um, when I, when I hear about coaches who, especially coaches of youth and high school levels, um, mm -hmm. when I hear that they're all about winning, right? Like it's either you win or you're a loser. You know, it, 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 it irks me because, um, you know, we, we talked about this before. You know, I, I'm the biggest competitor you're going to find. I love, to, I mean, I love to win, right? Yeah. And I hate to lose. Huh? At the same time, um, I understand that there is always going to be a winner and a loser in everything, right? Mm -hmm. Especially in sports. Um, and so when you make it that black and white for mm -hmm. young kids, um, you know, by the time they get to the high school level and, and collegiate level, um, and maybe in pro, if they get to that, if they get that far, um, that, that puts them in a very risky position mentally and emotionally mm -hmm. Because, you know, it's it's no longer about them wanting to develop themselves, right? Um, you know, we're talking about the process, all that good stuff. Yeah. But, you know, it's like, they, they, it's like they put their perception of success, uh, of how, you know, how they're achieving success or not, they, which a lot of times, you know, um, it coincides with happiness, coincides with how they view themselves as a person, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, that can put them in a bad position to where a lot of times the wins and losses are some, you know, are out of, out of our hands, right? Mm -hmm. Especially like in team sports, right? You can have the best damn game of, of your career yep. and still lose, right? Yeah. Yep. Even, in the, you know, you could go and play golf, play tennis, play badminton, you know, and you can, you can have the best game of your life, but guess what? Maybe your opponent just has a little bit better game that day, right? Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. And then, you know, as, as a coach, you're going to tell them that you're, they're losers because of that? Bullshit, you know? Uh, yep. Because, yep. And, that, and this is why, this is what kills the, the love of the game for so many young athletes because they have these coaches who do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell my athletes, I tell the teams I work with, listen, winning and wanting to win, wanting to win a championship, that should go without saying, right? Mm -hmm. That should be one of these goals that we talk about. Who, I mean, if you're going to come over here and come on this team and say you, you just want to lose, 
Nah, it's how it works, right? Yeah. So yes, yeah. we acknowledge the fact that we all want to win. We all want to win the championship. We all want rings. We all we all want we all want that bling, the trophies, all that good stuff, all the praise. Okay. Now, yeah. with that said, let's put that aside, okay? <laughs> and let's recognize the importance of the development to get there, right? Mm -hmm. Individually Definitely. and as a team. And if we if we could do that, we could do it together and and bring, you know, bring the coaches and the players, bridge that gap with leadership among the players, right, uh, and, and get that communication flowing, uh, mm -hmm. that's going to put us in a, in a good position. That will put mm -hmm. us in the driver's seat to achieve success. Mm -hmm. I never, I, I'll never tell my athletes um, to, like, you do X, Y, Z, you're always going to win. Mm -hmm. I never, it's, it's, not, it's not a realistic expectation that I'm setting for them. Uh, but what I will say is if you do X, Y, Z, if you do these things um, to the best of your abilities, okay, that the chances of success, the chances of you accomplishing certain goals, it's going to increase, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, it, it, and this is why, you know, I, it just, you know, it, it's um, when I see coaches who do a great job of uh, building the confidence within, the, within their players while also, while also um, developing their fundamentals of the game, Okay, mm -hmm. especially younger, right? Because younger, you should be focused on the fundamentals, all right? Mm -hmm. Fundamentals, building the confidence, building the love of the game. So by the time you pass them on to the next coach as they get older, right? Now, okay, now as the competition gets higher and higher, um, they're able to succeed, right? Mm -hmm. And to where it's not all about the wins, they, they know, hey, if I do this, chances of me winning, which goes without saying, as you talked about, are going to be up there. So mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't know, like what you've seen you know, as far as athletes. You talk to you at that at your level, yeah. Uh, and, and I don't know if you talk to them about maybe their past about that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know. And I just had a conversation. Um, I have these uh, sessions that I do with with everyone, but this particular session, it was, this was just a one on one session, and um, I emphasize the word play. You know, because when we talk about sports, what do we say? We don't say, uh, are you going to go outside and go work sports? No, you're going to go outside and go play sports. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, when you're talking to a child, you tell the child, uh, are you bored? Why don't you go outside and play? You know, and what ends up happening is that somewhere along the line, that whole concept of play gets lost and it becomes work. And I know I used this uh, Michael Jackson analogy earlier, but I'll use it again because it's kind of appropriate. Uh, you know, here's here was a kid that was a little kid dancing and just grabbing microphones and just trying to mimic other people that he'd seen. And someone saw something special in him that could be lucrative. And that someone <laughs> was his father. You know, <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, dad, I want to go outside and play. No, you, you gotta, you, you, you gotta get in front of the microphone. You, you know, we, you, you gotta, you gotta, who tells you that you gotta play? You know, when, when did play become something that you have to be told to do? And I, and I think that that's where the messages have gotten mixed with a lot of the, um, the young people athletes coming along it's they have a I have to go out and go work baseball I have to go work basketball I have to go work football instead of I have I, I want to I can't wait to go out and play basketball or I can't wait until I play football you know and I think that unfortunately the adults in these young people's lives have actually made play work because of what it can bring. Um, but I know in working with college athletes, uh, they, I talk, talked about the stakes being higher. Um, they come in and they come in with this pressure. Okay, I'm no longer in high school, so I'm surrounded. I, I was in high school, I, and you and I talked about this before. In high school, I was top of the line. I was A1 best athlete in the world. You go into college and you see guys with this superlative talent, uh, bigger, stronger. You know, as for the female athletes, you see more developed players, 
uh, people who seemingly know the game, you know, all the different intricacies of the game. And you're like, wow, do I belong here? You know, and I think it's up to, I think that's actually where we come in as sports psychologists and, 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 and mental coaches, mental preparation coaches. Those are the times when we're mostly is during those transitional periods. You know, um, we're, we're needed throughout, you know, but I think those are key parts because we have to realize that they're probably transitioning emotionally, psychologically, and, um, you know, that's a good place to really start helping those athletes to really grasp these new concepts of what play is. It's no longer, um, unfortunately, it's no longer enjoyment. It's, it's enjoyment. But it's okay to enjoy it, but we still need you to win, you know. And that's the hard part in terms of what do you feed the athletes as they transition? Do, do you make them feel that sense of urgency or do you tell them to relax, do what you've always done, do what you've done on the fields in, in your hometown or on the, on the playgrounds? You just continue to do what you've always done always been doing let that take care of itself and as long as you do that you know um the other things will come with it but i believe that a lot of athletes have this added sense of urgency i've got to be great and then a lot of those athletes unfortunately um they are not as successful as they need to be during that transitional period because they're so focused on becoming this accepted great figure as opposed to doing what got them there, you know? So it, it's, it's, it's very hard. It's very yeah, hard. Yeah, and, and I think another, um, another key factor that is involved with the younger ages is um, that we are seeing earlier and earlier specialization in mm -hmm. sports among these younger kids, right? Yeah. And what that means is that we're seeing more parents keeping their kids in one sport earlier and earlier, right? Um, where like before, um, and you still see this, but it, it's it's not as much. It's, it's mm -hmm. not as prevalent. Where you know parents will have their kids playing one, you know, baseball. Like you know, for me, I have I was in baseball, football, basketball, and, and my parents having different sports, playing different sports. Um, and then eventually high school, you know, I I, I played. A little bit of basketball, you know, and, and but mostly it was football. Um, but you know, going into you know, fast forward to today, um, a lot more parents are keeping their kid in one sport early on because in their mind, you know, they 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 simplify it to, you know, it's like this little math equation: more time in sport equals better, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which is not necessarily the case many times. <clears throat> I've seen this many times. Okay, go awry. Yeah. Where, when, and this is backed by research, look it up, okay? <laughs> um, yes, you might you might have that one prodigy kid, that Tiger Woods or whoever that's just playing since a kid. Yes, but you think about how many Tiger Woods are there compared to, <clears throat> compared to the field? Okay? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and what happens is when, when, when these parents are specializing with their kids in one sport and a lot of times it's like year round and, there's, and I, you know, I've seen it. I've seen it where it's like multiple teams, they're playing rec, they're playing club ball all at one time. They're, they're, they're seeing personal coaches, you know, personal trainers, all this stuff, right? Um, and it, it kind of goes into that Michael Jackson example of how, you know, A, there goes their childhood. Right, because because they're, they're busy either at practice or playing tournaments, games, you know, training, all that stuff. Um, and you know, what happens is increased rate for burnout, increased risk of injury because you're working the same muscle groups over and over and over again, 
right? Um, and this is why I tell, because I've had a kid, I've had a kid before, high school basketball player, who um, great great basketball player, but when the season was over, he was telling me that he wanted he wanted to to try out football for his senior year because uh, he wants to play football, you know, because he, he's always wanted to play, but you know, his dad has always kept him in basketball, right? Because his dad had that simple equation, more time equals better. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, he's like, I don't know how to tell my dad. And so, um, you know, his, his dad, when he, I remember his dad picked him up from, from our session and he asked me, he's like, what do you think about this? I was like, you know, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think it's a good idea, you know, if he wants to try something else out. And here's why, right? Not only will, will he be able to do it what he wants to do, especially for his senior year, right? Because, um, you know, he might not, this might be his last opportunity to try something like this. Um, but, you know, I know it's like a misconception where parents tend to think that if my kid plays a different sport, right, that they're, they, you know, their, their, their abilities are going to go down and maybe their main sport, right? Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. for instance, that's what this, this dad had, had told me. He's like, yeah, he's like, well, I want to keep my kid in basketball because if he goes and plays football, you know, his basketball skills are going to go out the window. I was like, well, no, right? And I told him how, how there's so many skills that other sports work on that transition translate to that main sport, right? Um, again, they can have their main sport, but, you know, they allow them to, to venture off, especially early on, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but like I was telling that dad, I was like, the footwork, agility, um, yeah, and the, the general teamwork stuff, working with a team, coaching, um, you know, learning new plays, learning different techniques, fundamental skills that you'd be surprised transition to basketball, right? Mm-hmm. I, I know with, you know, with the basketball with OCC that, that I coach right now is we have a couple of girls that have great footwork. We're doing mm-hmm. these ladders, you know, and we're, oh, my gosh, and turn out, they, you know, they played soccer, they played some other sport, you know, and you can see it. I'm like, oh, that makes sense, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why I tell parents, like, I've seen it. I've seen it at every level where, you know, the kid played different sports and, you know, they're, and, and actually it helps them miss their main sport a little bit too, right? Because if they're going all year round, the same thing, it just, it becomes boring. And these are kids we're talking about here, right? You know, they get bored, especially with kids nowadays, they get yep. bored doing the same thing over and over again, right? Their attention span is very little. Um, yep. And um, that's why I always urge parents, if, if a kid wants to try something else, let them, right? Mm-hmm. They can always come back to their main sport, whatever sport they want to focus on, right? And they eventually start, you know, when high school comes around, and maybe they can focus on that one sport. But, or, you know, how many athletes you know play two sports? I know I know plenty, right? Yeah. So, um, but as they get to that transition into youth, high school, and now college, um a big issue, and you kind of alluded to it too when we talked about this. Of now, you get this this kid who is, you know, the the big fish in the small pond, right? They're up here, everyone else is down here, so they're riding high, you know. Especially from their if they're from a small town, everyone knows who this person is. You know, it's like uh, <laughs> the example we talked about before, Booby Miles, right? Booby yep. Miles from Friday Night Lights. Um, you know, he, he was a king in that, in that, in that town, right? In Texas. Yep. Um, but, you know, all of a sudden, and we never saw what happened after, but, uh, you know, say you get this, this, this booby miles kid or this, this, this superb athlete at the high school level who is just, you know, just blowing everyone away. And all of a sudden they get to the college level and that talent gap goes from here to like right here. Okay. Mm-hmm. And, and all of a sudden, they're a small fish in a big pond. Mm-hmm. And now what? Yep. <laughs> oh, you know, you know, what do I do? Right? Because now I'm not just I'm not just like just just dominating all, all my peers. My peers are just as good as me, if not better. Right? Mm-hmm. That's what you get when you go to the college level and eventually pro. Like pro, I mean, it's like it's a dead heat. And this mm-hmm. is why I tell people when you get to that college elite level where the talent gap is right there. Mm-hmm. As an athlete, you're always trying to find that edge. What you and I do and all of our colleagues in the field of sports psychology do is we give them that edge with this mental training because the majority of people, at least right now, they're training their physical game. They're, training, they're, they're working on the fundamentals of their sport. They're not training this, 
right? Mm -hmm. And the ones who do, right? It's, it's been this well kept kept secret for a long time. It's the secret's coming out now, right? It's coming out. The, the field's booming. We're we're getting you know more and more people are, are sprouting up. Mental performance consultants. I love it. I love the yeah. growth I'm seeing in the field. And these my younger yeah. colleagues are growing up, and just people in general from all ages, all backgrounds, all areas of the world. Um, they're recognizing the importance of the mental game. And this yeah. is why I, I tell people to, you know, especially during this important time where they're going from one level to the next, that they need to work on this stuff because that mm -hmm. stuff is what's going to make the difference and also prepare them for that next level, that transition, so that when they feel challenged, right, when they're the small fish in the big pond and they're going against peers, that are, that talent is right there with them, right, that mental game is going to push them up just a little bit further. Mm -hmm. And actually, just to jump on what you said about the um, big fish, small pond, <laughs> two athletes combined, and we talked about this before, when I think about Allen Iverson and Terrell Owens, Allen Iverson was someone that said that football was his first love. You know, that is what he wanted to play. Um he said during his Hall of Fame speech that he felt like basketball was too soft, you know, and um, here's that two sport athlete, you know, uh, he excelled at both. Um, but when it was, I, I just get the feeling at some stage, someone spoke to him and said, hey, listen, you can either be an above average basketball player in the pros or you can be uh, a guy that may be on the bubble if you pursue football. You know, um, what do you? What would you like to do? Would you like to be a professional athlete, or do you just want to be a guy that just goes after his dream of playing football? And I'll see what happens. You know that kind of thing. You know, and. Um, well, I mean, obviously he chose right. You know, he made a good decision, you know. And, uh, I think so, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just always reflect on his uh, Hall of Fame speech when he, you know, he would always talk about – I did see a lot of his uh, football tape from uh, when he played uh, college ball, uh, high school football in um, – um, high school, I'm sorry. He played high school football, but he went on to Georgetown and played basketball. Uh, I believe someone told him, hey, here's the money maker. You know, you, you, this is what you should do. Well, he may have been saying, hey, but I love football. I, if I'm going to go to Georgetown, I'll play football. And I believe his mother got involved in that, you know, and saying, hey, you know, uh, she apparently went to Coach John Thompson and said, hey, grab my kid. You know, if you don't grab him, you know, something bad is going to happen to him. You know, so his athleticism became, in a way, the, the way to stay out of trouble, you know, and to be productive. So it wasn't necessarily about enjoyment at that stage from his mother's perspective. Her perspective was, I just need him to be productive and not, you know, be a statistic here, you know. And... Um, when I think about that whole circumstance, I'm like, wow, how did this kid, how did this I did maintain enjoyment and motivation for what, you know, he was being, you know, what for what he was involved in because he says that he loves football. And it, it would seem to me that he would like to pursue what he loved and maybe gone to play football at Georgetown or some other school as opposed to doing something that, it's just, I just happen to be pretty good at this other thing too. So I, I guess I'll do this, you know? So um, I always question his motivation. And when I look back at different tapes throughout his um, career, watching him in press conferences, uh, I'm like, wow, you know, as I reflect on him now, I look back and say, wow, this kid, you know, he found a way to, muster up this energy to continue to play this sport that is a secondary interest to him. Uh, but he had to find motivation and continue to play it. And it came through, I believe, the money, 
And that's something else I wanted to uh, touch on as well. The difference in the sports, the development. Football players stay in college long, you know, whereas basketball players either, um, they just stay for one year. You know, uh, the majority of them, especially if they know that they're going to be a top talent, they don't stay in school. They don't stay in college long. And again, there's that pressure of that transition. You know, it's it's the the, the people getting into your ear telling, oh, you know, just do one year at Duke and, you know, okay, Zion, you know, because there's a, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, you don't want to get hurt because if you get hurt, you know, that brings down your value and you won't be able to be this millionaire, this billionaire, well, not quite a billionaire, but this millionaire, you know, and I think that's the message that a lot of those athletes are getting now, especially when it comes to basketball in college, you know, so they don't get a chance to really enjoy the college experience. Um, I always look back at Tim Duncan. I said, he got it all. You know, he was able to go through four years, Wake Forest, and have a stellar career, and then transition into coaching afterwards. You know, so it's just a lot of impatience now. And I think that's what scares me about the, the athletes that make their transitions now. You know, um, they need someone to help them to restore that enjoyment and that patience you know, because some of them are really coming out too early and we see them I'm like, wow, this guy should, this guy is horrible. You know, he should have stayed in college and he probably should have. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's one of those things that's, that's hard with transition as well because of the uh, external pressures. You know, uh, I'm sure a lot of those athletes, they would probably say something simple as telling their parents, uh, I like I like my I like my professors, you know. I like my I like my uh my college coach. I, I want to stay with him a little longer, and they may be telling him, uh, give him a call, text him. But you need to go to the NFL or the NBA, you know. Uh, you know. So again, there's that whole Michael Jackson theory coming to play again. It's like, no, this is serious business. You've got to go make these millions. Uh, that of developing yourself <laughs> so yeah um and, and you, you kind of touched on a very interesting factor that we see a lot with the inner city kids um where another yeah we talk about external pressures from parents coaches all that good stuff but a very common one is the pressure to provide for the family um where you have a kid coming out from inner city, right? Gets recruited to go to a university. Um, great talent, right? And they get to the next level. And all of a sudden, you, know, you got these pro scouts talking to them, promising big money, right? And this is why, you know, when I, I hear about these situations where you have these kids coming out from the inner city who, who are trying to provide for themselves, not only for themselves, but for them, for their families. Right. Um, and they're saying, you know what, as much as I wish I can stay in college and, and uh, finish my degree, you know, if you're, the, if you're a Zion or one of these, you know, uber talented athletes coming out, um, you know, there is that risk, right? I mean, that that was when I remember when Zion first, you know, left high school. Um, and that and you know that was the huge topic as far as how long is is he going to be at Duke? You know, is he going to come back? If if he comes back to Duke, there is that risk of him getting hurt and his value tanking, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so we tell when you see that. It's like, what do you do? Like, if you work with one of these athletes who, who say that stuff, you know, it's like, what do you do? Uh, because, yeah, we, you know, we um, getting a degree is, is great and all, and we see these, you know, Tim Duncan's and all that. But we have this kid who's like, hey, you know, my, my parents are, 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 or parent uh, is scrapping for food. I can't afford 
a young year in college and, and, and having them wait on that. I need to get my contract right now. Mm-hmm. Right. How are you going to blame the kid? You know? Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and so that's a whole other a side that, you know, that go, it goes on behind the scenes that, that people don't maybe recognize. Right. They're going to say, Oh no, he's not ready to go pro yet. She's not ready. You know, she, she needs more time in the, in the, uh, the Collins race before she goes pro. Um, but are, they're not asking the question like, well, it's fine to know why they want to leave college early, right? Yeah. And this is why, too, like even today's pro athlete, um, they're more business people now than ever before. Um, you know, it, it's about the money. You, 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 know, you don't see these uh, players being tied down to a franchise like you once did, right? Yeah. Um, which I get because, you know, I, I've, heard, I've heard both sides. I've heard, you know, how – um, you know, the upper management of, of a of a pro sports club will say, Well, hey, we don't we can't we can't pay you this much for whatever reason. Um, but we want you to we want you to be loyal to this franchise. Well, mm-hmm. you know, the player is saying, Well, okay, I'll show you loyalty if you show me contract, right? Because you talk about loyalty, this is coming from the player side that I'm here, you talk about loyalty, right? How low, how low are you when you just traded my, my colleague away to another team just like that, mm-hmm. right? And so that's why, you know, you're, you're seeing the athletes becoming more, um, you know, more savvy as far as, hey, like, you want to invest, I'm an asset, right? I'm an asset, and if you want to invest in me, this is what it's going to take because I know if I'm the athlete, I know that, my my day here with this franchise could be gone like that. I can be cut. I can be traded. All right, and so I have to get mine while I still can. So this is why I see so much. You know, that's why I I, I always take all the different sides and just kind of take it all in and not try to like just jump on one side or the next because there are two sides, Sarah, and possibly more. Right, um, and so that's why you see, you sometimes see these athletes who are put in these positions that maybe they want to do something like finish college, right? Or maybe they feel, oh, maybe I can, I can use another year um, of college and maybe I, I need to get more experience. But sometimes they're in, this, they're in these situations where they don't have the opportunity to do that. Right? Yeah. And and also, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking, you know, what about those players in the European? Do those players... Th- th- I don't know the statistics, but it seems like they come to the NBA older, you know, and it seems like they actually probably get the full enjoyment out of their play during their younger years. You know, uh, they, you know, they, they play little league uh, football, basketball, you know, baseball's big overseas, you know, uh, little league games and things like that. And, um, then they transition again to, you know, JV, varsity sports and things like that. But it seems like those players in those other countries, those athletes in those other countries, they really get to really develop without that added pressure of the financial gain, you know. And um, we see them in, a, in the Olympics a lot. And a lot of those uh, athletes are, you know, early mid twenties, you know, and, uh, I'm like, wow. And then they come to the NBA fully developed, you know, um, I don't like, again, I don't know the statistics on it, but I just have a few players in mind that I've watched come from overseas and play in the NBA, for instance. Wow. This is, this is, um, they're, they're, they got an actual enjoyment, what I would consider to be an enjoyment out of their young lives. Whereas the pressures are different for the American born uh, student athlete and things like that, you know, so it's, it's, it's kind of a tricky situation there, but um, I, I, I like, I like where they've gone, you know, in terms of they made, uh, they stopped the college, I'm sorry, they stopped the high school athletes from going straight from high school to the pros they eliminated that but 
are you really doing anything by telling the guy, okay, you got to play at least one year at college? You know, like what's the message there? Because I think the ultimate message is not being received. And I think that that was put in place for developmental purposes. But uh, <laughs> these guys, you know, they may get to college and they just have free reign to do what they do. All they're doing is basically showcasing their talents for the worst team in the league, you know, um, so the worst teams in the league can get a opportunity to see what they'd be getting the following year, you know, and uh, where I thought it was really designed to maybe help an athlete say, you know, maybe I will stay, stay in college and, you know, work on my degree and, you know, do some other things. So it, it, it gets kind of tricky, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and, and this is why you're seeing more and more athletes at the college and pro level advocating for college athletes to be paid, mm -hmm. right? Especially if you're, you're going to use their names and likeness, you know, in like video games and marketing, all that stuff. These kids ain't getting a dime. <laughs> right, at, least, at least that we know of, right? Uh, we don't know what goes behind the scenes, but we won't go there. That's all. It's all yeah. the other topic, but, um, but, but yeah, I mean, because, yeah, you know, you you look at you know certain certain sports, um, and this is a, this is a debated issue, right? You look at um, uh, sports that require you know you to go you know go to college um, before you go pro, and but you, you saw what happened to Lamella Ball. What do you what do you do? He went overseas, right? Played a year, I think, um, and then came in. He was eligible for the draft, mm -hmm. right? And so you know because hey, school wasn't his thing apparently, right? Um, mm -hmm. And he wanted to make money and while well, playing professionally. Um, so because of his mind, right? And um, you know he probably was like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not going to be in college. I'm not going to go in college for school. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I rather I rather spend this year developing while also just you know focusing on, on basketball rather than having to take classes where I, where that where is that going to get me mm -hmm. uh, because again school is not for everyone and this goes into the the norms of the, these the different societies right in the u.s the norm is graduate high school go to college right that might not be the norm somewhere else right, right. and that's why you see these you know foreign players coming in um, and, and trying to compete in the NBA, WNBA, NFL, MLB, all these, all these big time, um, you know, organizations, and try to make some money because, and, and, and you know, it's when you start dictating what a, a a player, a young adult can do, this is where that debate comes in because it, you know, that's this is why so many players are are talking up so much now about. You know, why are why are we allowing these uh, you know NCAA to to dictate what these players can get right because mm -hmm. NCAA is making plenty of money so and and these players aren't seeing a, a piece of it and mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to require these athletes to go to college okay then let's see a cut of, of whatever you're making right mm -hmm. um, and so that's why that's the whole thing that whole debate is still going on mm -hmm. um, and at, at what point are you going to say hey are, are we just going to get rid of, you know, um, the requirement to go to college? Or are you going to allow athletes and team, professional teams, to sign these athletes right out of high school, right? Mm -hmm. You look at soccer, okay? You have, you have these young kids playing professionally around the world under 18. Yep. Okay? Yes. And yeah, they're doing okay. So, you know, I'm talking about that side of the, of the argument, right? Yep. Um and you know you have these uh, you know these these sports basketball football baseball all these different sports that are uh, requiring the athletes to go to college. If you're the athlete and you say, "Hey, I want to take that chance and go straight to pro," yes, we you know, we understand the risk involved, right? So in so many different ways, yes. They're, you know, especially like in football, they're going against, you know, these big boys, um, these big yep. men in, in the NFL, right? Um, so there's that risk. But, hey, what, what if you see these kids, that are, they're grown-ass men come out of high school, I'm like, oh, man, okay? Sh shouldn't they have the opportunity to, to 
to take that chance, right? Should, shouldn't they have that choice? Shouldn't the, the organizations that are assigning these players, shouldn't they have that choice to take that risk on this kid, right? Because, yeah. hey, we saw, what, like, you know, back when the NBA was allowing kids to go to go pro right out of high school, um, mm -hmm. some of these kids worked out, some not so much. Right. right. But, hey, the, the you know, it, they let the NBA, all the teams, take that chance, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's like, you know, going from one level to the next, there is that transition period where, you know, what do we do? Um, and when you have a kid that knows, like, I, I do not want to go to school anymore. High school, mm -hmm. that is, right? When you have these kids, okay, I, I mean, you, 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 go, you can guide them only so much to, you know, when they're an adult, hey, they're an adult. It's their mm -hmm. life. I mean, at that point, you know, this is one thing I do with my clients is when, when they're faced with these decisions, um, I always have to lay things out on the table and say, mm -hmm. you know, we've kind of talked about this before, you know, what's behind door number one? If you take this route, maybe, okay, this route is staying in school. Take door number two, going, going pro. Door number three, you know, what have you, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there are different challenges that are involved with each level, each, you know, each decision. And I want to make sure they're making a well-informed decision. And, making sure that I'm not making that decision for them, right? Mm -hmm. Because whether that decision works out for them or not, it was their decision, okay? And, and this is not just me trying to cop out and say, oh, it, was, it wasn't my fault. You made it. No, no. no. It's their decision and they made it well informed, right? Because, of course, all of us make decisions in our lives that sometimes work out, sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. This is a part of life, right? Um, but we have to allow them to grow and make that decision, right? And so, um, you know, you look at even like pro sports, how – these you know these these fresh out of college or fresh out of high school pros are, are coming out and all of a sudden they, you know they have to deal with now maybe they have they have a family maybe they, they have like money financial issues right yes they make a lot of money but how, are they managing it well okay mm -hmm. you know, some people are like financial issues these these guys you know these guys and girls mm -hmm. are making millions of dollars yeah mm -hmm. we talk about the transition and we'll finish up with that in a second but the transition after sport right. How, can they keep that money and so you know uh i don't know like i know you talked about that that uh that transition from um allowing allowing the, the students whether they should have the opportunity to go pro or not mm -hmm. yeah you know i i think that um and, and it's interesting because i just spoke to uh, uh let me see where are we at june and april i spoke to a young man and uh his goal was to transition into the uh, NBA and uh, still is, you know, um, I, I, you know, I haven't seen him up close and personal in terms of his skill level to see if he's actually, you know, the caliber of a person that's, that's ready for the NBA. But I just think that, um, and, and I remember listening to his story, to the point of what we're talking about. It's financial, you know, it's, it's, it's all driven by finances and something you just touched on as well. And we'll transition into that as far as after sports, you know, um, most athletes at a division two, II, division three school, they tend to seem more realistic about the, their aspirations to become pros um, because they seem to feel that um, that whole enjoyment piece that we, we were talking about, it seems like those athletes tend to engage in their sport in college because of the enjoyment, predominantly because of the enjoyment. Uh, the winning is secondary. Um, the possibility of going on to play professional, that's pretty like a, a tertiary situation for most of them. But the realistic mindset seems to have set in with those particular athletes. Now, when we talk about those division ones, you know, the, the Alabamas and Auburns and, you know, uh, Penn States and all those kinds of places, uh, Ohio States, where, you know, you know that you're being viewed 
as a potential uh, first, second round pick in the NFL draft. Let's just go with football. Um, what ends up happening with them is now they are find, trying to find ways to justify going going into the NFL with maybe, what is it, three years? Do they have to do three years now of uh, college? Two. Two or three. It, okay. Well, yeah. Good. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I would hear these side stories about what they like to do with their life other than sports. Yeah. You know, I would listen to those stories. And some of these athletes seem more passionate about their majors as opposed to playing professionally. And um, if things don't work out in terms of football, you know, two, three years max for most guys is, is the, is the uh, limit on your uh, time playing football. If that doesn't work out now, depending on how you feel, you have to go back and finish that degree that you started. Now you have to re-motivate yourself mm -hmm. to get back into your studies but now you have a different beast that you're dealing with because you may feel that you failed, quote unquote, failed at your attempt to become a professional football player. You know, so now where's your motivation to go back, finish your degree, be still wallowing in that whole mess of mud in terms of not reaching that goal of making the uh, NFL. So that's the part of the transition that scares me for a lot of athletes as well, because if their professional aspirations don't work out, are you going to have it inside of you, that innate desire to finish your degree so you can move forward, you know? So that, that's kind of, it gets kind of tricky also. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely does. And um, you do take that risk, right? If you're the athlete and, and you say, hey, I'll take that risk of leaving college early and um, or even just not even going to college and go and play pro overseas for a year and then come back and, you know, go into uh, going and get signed uh, or drafted, uh, you, you take that risk. And that's something that I, if I am working with a client who is in that situation, I would make sure they understand. Again, door number one, door number two, door number three, these are the potential risk, okay, that can happen, okay, and the potential benefits, right? Um, but at least they know. And, you know, my biggest thing with, with helping athletes um, transition from sport to the next chapter in their life, whether that, hey, sometimes it happens early after high school, sometimes it happens after college, sometimes it happens after pros, right, after they're done with their professional careers. Um, one thing I like to do is to take a, a proactive approach and help them realize that what they do is not who they are, right? Because if we can separate the individual from what they do, when it's time for them to hang them up, and hopefully it's on their own terms, right? Hopefully it's on their own terms and it's not some debilitating injury or some other, you know, situation that comes up that's out of their control. Um, hopefully it's on their own terms, but you know, by the time it's time for them to hang them up, right, they're better able to transition to the, the next chapter in their life, which is life after sport. And this mm -hmm. is why I love working when, you know, I work with the clients and I'll have them do like certain activities just to get their brains going, right, get, get their minds going and start thinking about, like, other than your sport, what are you passionate about, right? What do you love to do? Or what, what are some ideas that you've, all, you've always wanted to do? You know, I've had pro, you know, players that tell me, hey, you know, I want to open up um, a gym. I want to open up my own training center. I want to do, you know, I want to go uh, fish professionally. You know, it, it's just all these different. And, and yes, yeah, so sometimes, you know, it's you see, you hear the passion in that. And I love that, right? Mm -hmm. Because you just never know. You never know what car life is going to deal with you. And this is why I tell them, hey, the, the reality of it, okay, is there is going to be a point in time um, that the time to transition from sport to non-sport is, is going to come. And my job, one of, one, of my, one of my job is to help you prepare for that mentally and emotionally um, so that when that time does come, whether you're ready for it or not, um, or whether it's, whether it's on your own terms or not, um, you're ready, 
right? You're ready. Uh, and a big part of that is the identity portion of it, right? Mm -hmm. If they say, you know what, I'm Danny, you know, and yes, I, I, I practice sports psychology or day. I'm a football player, right? But for so long, hey, I'm not, I'm not Danny the football player. I'm not Danny the basketball player. I'm Danny who plays basketball, right? And so once that basketball part of my life is done, right, I'm so me. And that doesn't take anything away from me. This is why I always like to get these minds going of my athletes and ask them, who are you, right? Are you a son? I'm a son. I'm a future husband, okay? Um, I'm, uh, I'm a brother, right? I'm an uncle, all this stuff, right? That's who I am. I'm a hard worker. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm dedicated to helping people. That's who yeah. I am, right? Um, and what I do does not make me who I am. It's what I do. And this is why I, I help my athletes recognize while they're playing, okay? That's a key. You don't wait till after you, it's too late. While mm -hmm. they're playing, help them recognize and build the foundation of who they are as an individual. So by the time they're done with their sport, that sense of self is already solidified. And then what they do is now going to change, but that doesn't change this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And that's a major component, you know, it's, it's, and a lot of what you just said, I couldn't help but to think about the parents, you know, and um, the parents are the ones who are going to need that sports psychology consultant as well, you know, because sometimes you may have an overbearing parent, you know, who uh, may see greatness in their child and they may go through great extremes to uh, make sure that they on a certain path towards that greatness, uh, possibly moving forward at the uh, professional level. But I think the sports psychologist also needs to talk to the parent in the sense of, hey, listen, to your point, door number one, door two, door number three. Some parents may not have a door number two or three, you know, and because they don't have it, they don't instill that door number two or three in their child. They just tell their child, hey, there's door number one. This is the only door. There are no other doors. The only thing here other than this door is just a, a window that's 10 stories high. You know, so <laughs> you, you gotta, you've got to go through this door. So the parent is the person who ultimately needs that sports psychologist at that age as well for, you know, as far as the, uh, the uh, young athlete is concerned because we need to work together and try to allow that young person to understand to your point you know you're not a basketball player you're not a baseball player that's not your identity you play baseball you play basketball this is what you do it's not war um that as simple as that sounds and as ethical as that sounds uh unfortunately i just um and i've, I've seen some of it in, you know, certain situations where the parent is basically telling me that, no, that is their identity. What they play is their identity. And I don't want you tampering with that because, quote unquote, they may not say it out their mouths, but here's the meal ticket. You know, uh, this is the person that's going to make it. You know, so, um, and even if it's not the aspiration of turning pro, I want my child to get a scholarship, you know, and uh, if that's the uh, main goal, they tr basically will feed that monster of, <laughs> well, this is, you've got to do this, you know. Um, it can be simple as, well, mom, I don't really like baseball anymore i don't really like basketball well you're good at it you got to keep doing it because this is the thing that's going to get you the scholarship and you end up getting involved in something reluctantly you know and uh you're only doing that have been typical throughout your life which is to listen to your parents and what they say you know so that's where it gets tricky and that's where i feel like those are the places where we need to have that sports psychology consultant engage with the parent as well, say, we have to basically look at down the road, what if? We we have to talk about what ifs, you know, and um, some parents are open to it, 
others are opposed to it. And um, I think uh, the athlete will go as far as the parent will allow it to go. So, so it becomes tricky, Doc. I tell you, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. We we got our work cut out for us in certain situations like that, but <laughs> absolutely, but I, I'm I'm willing to go through it. You know, yeah, yeah, and that's why we're here. That's why we do yeah. what we do, man. And it's, um, you know, what I would tell parents, especially if uh, any parents are listening to this, is yes, that that could be their their one mill ticket to the next level, right? Um, but realistically, and be honest here, right? Is is this going to be forever, right? Unless you're Tom Brady, it's not. <laughs> it's not right. Okay. Um, and, and and yeah, and you know what? Guess what? A lot of the athletes and parents don't like to hear the reality of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. And my mm -hmm. job is not only push them to be the best possible athlete right now. Okay, because and make them. I make them. I help them realize that. Listen. By me helping them uh, strengthen their identities now and who they are and, and not, you know, what they do is not who they are. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking away from their athletic performance. I'm, I'm, I'm also here to help build that too. Mm -hmm. I'm all, but my job, and this is what so many coaches and mental coaches and people in, the, in sports kind of don't do a, um, a great job of, of and it's like once these athletes are done, they just throw them off to the side. And mm -hmm. my job is to, is not is to help prevent that from happening, right? It's the same thing in the military. Once that once the military, once these you know these these brave men and women serving our country, once they're done with their time, they forget about them. I've heard many horror stories from veterans, you know, that's not getting the help they need, especially the mental help, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what a lot of these athletes feel. You look at Lamarcus Aldridge that just came out and talked about, you know, how he, how he experienced depression because. He doesn't know what to do anymore. Basketball was who he was and who he is. And guess what? Basketball is not there anymore, right? Mm -hmm. He's transitioning out. But now he's in this situation where what do I do? Who mm -hmm. am I? Because I, mm -hmm. I was a basketball player, but not anymore. At least yeah. not, not to that extent, right? Like I was. Yeah. Um, and so that's why I, help, I try to help athletes and parents and coaches, anyone else who wants to listen, help them recognize that. Right, mm -hmm. I don't recognize that it's it's inevitable. The time to transition from sport to non-sport, that next chapter is inevitable. And so, with that understanding, with that reality, and once we can accept that, because many people don't want to accept that, but when you once you do, then we can help prepare them while also bolstering them in the moment, helping them as much as we can with their athletic performance, right? But also mm -hmm. when the time does come. That's going to help them transition, and, and they're not going to just feel like they're throwing out. They're not going to just feel like, who am I? Because mm -hmm. they can, they're, they're going to be Danny. They're going to be Jerry. They're going to be wh whoever. And mm -hmm. what I do, hey, I'm not, I'm not a basketball player anymore. But you know what? I'm going to go start a business. I'm going to go work on some nonprofit stuff. I'm going to go be a coach. I'm, I'm going to go play, be a high school coach. Yeah. Whatever, right? But I'm still me. Mm -hmm. That's where we, our job as, as sports psychologists, professionals, uh, coaches out there, parents, colleagues, whomever, who are working with these kids from the beginning to the end, it's their job to help build that person, build that confidence so that while they're in their sport and even, just as importantly, after their sport, okay, when that time does come, they're able to transition each, each step along the way mm -hmm. confidently, okay, and effectively. Yep, absolutely. And, and one quick you just brought up Tom Brady, and it's ironic. Uh, he was a, maybe a few picks, and I'm trying to remember if that sixth round was the final round during that year, or was it still seven rounds? But nevertheless, he was, let's just say it was seven rounds during that time. There were seven rounds. He was a round away from not playing at all. You know, he was a round away from having to think about his degree at Michigan. You know, what do I do now? Because I'm sure as he sat around watching rounds one through five in the first three quarters of round six go by. And I, I, I'm sure reality started to set in like, OK, all right, doesn't look like I'm going to get chosen to play football at the quarterback position. What am I going to do now? And I'm sure 
were some of the realistic thoughts that were coming to his mind. You know, I uh, think back to Kurt Warner, you know, bagging groceries, you know, um, who would who would have known? You know, uh, he had to take the uh, route of the uh, arena league, you know, and those kinds of things. So um, that's something else that could have, you know, damaged his spirit as far as, um, wow, I've got to play in this league. I'm, I don't get an opportunity to play in the, the, the big league, you know. But, yeah, but you have those situations where um, those were two individuals who at some stage – may have um, felt as though that that depression and that feeling of worthlessness, um, you know, I, I'm not living up to my potential. You know, those kinds of things may have creep, creeped in with those guys, you know, at some stage. So, um, but as life would have it, you know, they were able to turn things around and, you um, both of them, uh, last time I checked, the Hall of Famers now. So, well, <laughs> the one guy, you know, he's he'll be a Hall of Famer, you know. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, it's inevitable, of course, you know. But, um, but yeah, but just – I was just thinking about the Tom Brady situation. Like, wow, he was really that far – like a real possibility at this. He may not have a professional football career. So, right. he's got to utilize his, his uh, degree. Yeah. You know, interesting, you know, just how things kind of turn. So, yeah. Well, hey, great points, man. And, and you know, what? and this wrap this up here. It's um, I'm glad we're having, having this conversation because it, it's so important and um, to help these, these athletes at all ages, at all levels, help prepare them um, for whatever comes next. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's if it's the same sport or if it's something else. OK. Um, it, it's a it's a conversation that I, frankly I feel needs to be had more and needs to be addressed more because it's you know um, if we can help these athletes and their families um, you know prepare for that next level the next chapter in their lives uh, that can go a long way in helping so many other aspects and not only in their sport but also their life their physical health and and as we're finding out just as more important mental health right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so Jared, Dr. Jared Lampkin, I appreciate you. Uh, as always, I appreciate the conversation. Uh, you know, and if it, anyone wanted to get in contact with you, uh, what would be the best way? Well, right now, the best way is through my email. It's, uh, J A R E D L A M K I N at gmail.com. That's the, uh, fastest and quickest way to get through and, We'll just take it from there. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, Jared. Yeah. Um, you know, you're over there in North Carolina on the other side of the country. But, hey, we're covering all aspects, man. We're covering all grounds over here. <laughs> right. Yeah, um, going... yeah. <laughs> oh, but was okay. Yeah. You know, thank you again for coming on. Thanks again for the conversation. And uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all for uh, coming on and, and uh, for another episode of the Dr. Coach Show. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. All right.